to uh, this is uh, this is David Greenheck. He's with a company called Norby, Norby Company, and uh, he's going to be giving us our talk. And, and then after after the talk, uh, or during you know part of the talk is really going to be us working on the project, like we talked about for the last you know few days and stuff like that. So uh, I'll just uh, turn it over. Great, thank and, you. Uh, come on in. Sorry. Don't worry, you haven't missed anything. We're just getting started. Dave said, I'm Dave Greenheck uh, with Norby Company. And once I get this <laughs> screen figured out, oh, I can't sit there. We go. I'm just going to get the slideshow. There we go. And uh, actually, if you want to use a slide advancing device, yeah. that may be added. So, no, you know, I only have these slides, so I'll just. Okay, all right. Anyways, a little bit of background on me, so you know who the heck's talking to you today. Um, I'm a professional engineer. I'm a member of ASHRAE and uh, the Association of Energy Engineers. And um, so I, you know, I got a mechanical engineering degree. Um, took the uh, did the engineering and training. Um, studied under a licensed uh, professional engineer, and then took the PE exam. Worked in the business for a while, and uh, you know, and uh, now I'm doing sales. But uh, again, uh, design engineer, project manager, energy and maintenance manager, and sales engineer is my industry experience. A little over 16 years in the business. I'm a, a graduate of the United States Naval Academy, class '89, where I got a, a naval science degree. Uh, went uh, into the fleet where I became a surface warfare officer and a chief engineer on uh, two ships. Um, left the Navy as a lieutenant and got a second degree from the University of Washington in mechanical engineering. Um, worked for the train company, did their sales training in La Crosse, Wisconsin. And uh, I've been with the Norby company for uh, over 12 years now. Um, I wanted to put a few slides together to explain how sales reps uh, work in the business, how we interface with other trades. Uh, do you guys talk much about? No, we really don't. We okay. haven't. We haven't well, this yeah. just be a yeah, short, short yeah. five, yeah. Uh, <laughs> ten minute uh, talk about how the industry works, at least here. Um, and we're not much different than others. Um, so there's wholesalers, uh, known commonly as vendors. And uh, that would be like Ferguson, uh, Familian, um, oh gosh, there's four or five others. There's uh, Gensco. And these are big, uh, big outfits that sell a lot of packaged equipment, uh, a lot of uh, refrigerant uh, parts and pieces. Um, anything that a uh, mechanical, con uh, mechanical technician, refrigerant tech, or sheet metal tech is going to need to do a project they typically have. <clears throat> um, then there's companies like my company, Norby Company. Uh, we are smaller, we're engineered sales, typically with a uh, math or science degree, physics or math, and uh, usually uh, licensed engineers. Um, uh, for example, like myself, I worked in the business for a few years and then got into sales. So. What we do, um, our customers are consultants, owners, and contractors, and we assist consultants in system and equipment design selection. Uh, we help the uh, the engineers schedule and specify their equipment, so we get it on the plan. So we make sure it fits and works with the system. And in some cases, uh, you know, uh, some of us have more experience in in the consultant's job when we're interfacing with young consultants. So we've become a very useful tool to them. Um, one thing to, to note about that is um, we're, not, uh, we're not paid for our, our time with consultants. Uh, most of us are commissioned salesmen. Uh, our company, we're 100% commissioned. So if we don't sell equipment, then we don't make money. So our time to the consultant is gratis. Uh, in return, we expect that if we help them with their design and help them lay out our, equi our equipment, that they specify our equipment, 
and they hold to the specification uh, come bid time, post bid time, typically. Um, and that's that's all we ask for them. But in some cases, that's that's quite a lot. Yeah. So uh, to the contractors. Um, Again, mechanical and, and sheet metal contractors, uh, who I'm referring to, so mechanical is on the wet side, right? Bathing with water, hot or, or chill. And then uh, sheet metal contractors usually taking care of anything that's DX, you know, direct expansion refrigeration, and, uh, you know, uh, gas heat, uh, you know, heat vent and refrigeration. Um, so a typical job has us uh, designing, bidding, submitting, on our equipment if we are low bid and usually that's determined long after the bid <laughs> in most cases um, delivering equipment um, you know ordering delivery starting it up commissioning it and warranting the equipment through whatever that warranty period is typically it's just parts but oftentimes there'll be parts and labor uh, and uh, and then the engineers again they don't buy from us but uh, but because we help them specify, um, we expect that they hold to the specs. Um, so what's important to a rep? That our time's not wasted since we don't get a salary and we're typically commissioned, as I said before. Um, that we contribute to a project in a meaningful way, um, value added. Um, that we are treated with respect as part of the design team and the construction team. Um, and that, it, I'll go a little bit more into that. There's certain contractors that are very sophisticated design builders or large uh, mechanical contractors. Um, they, you know, they've got very experienced staff. They understand that it's a two-way street. Uh, when we bid to contractors, uh, whether we get the job or not, we go back to them later for feedback. We want to know where we were, how we competed. They, a good contractor will take the time to uh, go through the project with you. And it usually takes five, ten minutes tops uh, to know where you were, where your competition was, to hear you know any kind of issues or complaints about what was different, what the other guy was saying they had, and what they didn't. Um, a contractor is not astute, uh, maybe new, or is just not good or at, at playing that role. They may tell you they don't have time. But because it's a two-way street, if a contractor is playing with your numbers or they're not giving you feedback, eventually they don't get a they don't get a number from you. So they need us to. We have to give them pricing. Um, if you're laid out, there's no one else bidding, and you're sideways with a contractor, then sometimes they won't get a they won't get a price. But 99% of the time, it works really well. Um, we work with all the contractors. I don't have a single contractor I don't give pricing to. And, um, and we get good feedback from them, and we're able to help them and the engineers before and after bid. Um, oftentimes, when we're bidding work, uh, we're looking at it two weeks before. When it hits the streets, uh, the architect gets it out to the plan centers. And we will find the errors. And those errors, we can get those to the contractors and the engineers in time. We're all working together to find these. Then they can make a, an addendum, a change to the schedule drawings or specifications to uh, pick up these uh, mistakes or oversights so that um, when it does bid, it bids correctly. No one's um, missing anything. And uh, that helps the, the owner client later and the engineer to avoid change orders. And no one likes that. No one wants to have to deal with it. And uh, that's why I say it's a team process and everyone needs to work together. And that's how it normally works. Um, and again, one thing we also value is that we develop and grow relationships with our engineering and, and uh, contractor customers. Um, you know, if, if I could win the lottery uh, tomorrow, I may not be doing this. Uh, I would be lying if I said I would. <laughs> but you gotta, if you got to work, you got to do something you love doing. And uh, this I love doing. And, um, one of the things I really like about it is developing the relationships and being on the team, uh, going through the project, either plan spec or design build job. Um, because when it's all said and done, it's commissioned, installed and commissioned, 
you know, I, I gain a lot of pride out of uh, seeing a system work uh, that I had either uh, something to do with or a great deal to do with. So uh, it's a great industry you're you're learning about, and hopefully going into. And uh, with that note, we'll. Uh, Could I have you describe the difference between design, build, and plan inspection? Sure. Sure. So the two big differences in in work that is uh, bid or are generated is uh, plan and spec, plan and specification, where it goes um, through a consulting engineer and uh, architect. And, and design, build, and plan spec can go all the way up to uh, the general trades too. So um, plan spec, an architect, engineering team puts to get, uh, together a set of plans and specifications that are publicly bid um, to contractors and general contractors, mechanical, sheet metal contractors. The um, you know low bid wins typically, and um, and that process uh, is uh, kind of juxtaposed to the design build process that has uh, general contractors, uh, mechanical and sheet metal contractors working and electrical contractors, sorry, working together as a team to. Uh, make a, a design um, that um, they are, they're either competing uh, against a select group of design builders, or it might be through a general contractor, GC, uh, CM, uh, construction management, where they do like a fixed fee, they set a budget up front, um, and then they have to work inside that budget. Um, so those are kind of the, the extremes of how it goes down. And each has its advantages and disadvantages. But um, those are the two types of processes you'll see most around here. And lately, we've had a lot of uh, design assist, where consultants will kick the job off and um, get, get it through from schematic design to design development. And uh, contractors usually bid on that work. It might be 50% drawings. Um, and they'll take it from there, either fixing in a fee or doing, uh, you know, uh, the equivalent of time material. I can't think of what you call that. Uh, but um, that's kind of a morph in between. And, and I think that's that sort working of, around here. It it's working because it it usually at the time it got heavy again was uh, when consultants were down on work. Yeah. <laughs> they had time, to, and the design builders did not have time. So their in-house guys were busy, so they outsourced it. And there's a few outfits that do well at that. I like doing that as part of their uh, repertoire, but um, it's it's fairly limited. And you'll see it a lot at the base at the bases. Um, the, the military bases. Yeah, yeah. military bases. Yeah. So, um, so just this is every every rep uh, representative has many lines they represent. This is kind of an example of my line. I have some other lines as well. Uh, typically between a dozen and, and two dozen is what uh, rep firms will have. There's about a dozen rep firms that are involved in, in HVAC work in the area. Um, and they overlap between uh, boilers and pumps, then the heating side equipment, exchangers. And, um, and then what I call the air conditioning um, chiller uh, group. So we have about six competitors, including us, that we're dealing with on a daily basis. And then you know there's a few others that I'll I'll compete against in other work. Uh, so not everybody's lines match up. There's overlap and some stuff that my my uh, my biggest competitor has I don't have. Some of the stuff I have he doesn't have. But um, these firms are about uh, 10 to 20 people, uh, including staff, with five to 10 uh, sales engineers out there, you know, uh, hitting the streets. Um, our big line is is McQuay, and uh, that's similar to like a uh, York Carrier train, and now it's Dyke McQuay actually, um, and. Uh, Today, uh, I was going to run through software for the water source heat pumps 
using the Quay software package. So I don't know, you, you've probably spent a lot of time on this. Uh, we, we have been spending some time on it, but if you... Uh, I'll just give a yeah, you know, overview yeah, to get everybody. It's always good. It's always on. good for someone else to say it besides me. Sure. <laughs> 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 a heat pump, um, and there's many types of heat pumps. There's air cooled, water source, or air source, water source. Today we're talking about water source, and it's basically taking energy from one place to another. Um, to uh, another place where you want it, uh, a useful place, a useful, uh, a useful um, uh, application for that energy. So uh, ground source, geothermal, and you're taking low grade heat in the ground, maybe it's five feet below the ground here in Seattle, I think it's around uh, 50 degrees almost year round, whether it's really cold or really hot, it kind of stays at that, uh, that temperature, swings maybe a few degrees. The deeper you get into the ground, the, uh, the more stable that, that temperature is throughout the year. Uh, so you go down 100 feet, the ground water, will, you won't see a budge. It'll be right there. Um, and you're taking that through a refrigeration process on the, uh, in the heat pump, in this case a water heat pump. And there's water to water and water to air. We're going to talk about water to air on the selection program. Um, so it's running through a coaxial condenser coil. So that uh, ground water coming in at 50 degrees, say we're doing uh, <coughs> comfort cooling, it comes in at 50. And the refrigerant <coughs> is, is now hot, and it's rejecting through an exchanger, uh, through the coaxial condenser, which basically is a tube and a tube. Uh, refrigerant on the outside and water on the inside and it's just coiled around in the in the heat pump and it's coming out that water coming out maybe 60 degrees going back into the ground either in a closed loop through piping or it might be a uh, you know a uh, open well where they're just pumping water into the ground and uh, pulling it back up have you seen like an aquifer? Here? that's a mount side job where we're you're pumping in 800 gallons per minute to the high school there. <laughs> they, they pumped, they did the well, did all the geo work, drilled the, the well, they had test wells, so they figured they could do this. It's a, you know, Mount Sai, you all know where that is? Yeah, North Bend area. And so they drilled the, the wells, and when they started the plant, and this was with those temperature amplifiers, the amplifiers, they, they were able to get, uh, 700 gallons out of the ground, you're only able to put 350 back in. Well, that's a problem. <laughs> that's a lot of water you've got to send somewhere. So, fortunately, there was a lot of flexibility in our plant and our equipment that we could do less water and do more delta T. So, it worked out fine, but. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Ugly, ugly issues. Yeah. And, and we've done them over in. Um, Richland at Battelle Labs. Oh, yeah. They've got a nice big aquifer there right next to Columbia River. How many cares are you pumping and dumping this stuff? You've got to, code wise, you got to, uh, you know, get approval. But the uh, temperature, yeah. okay. basically, yeah, I mean, in a, and it's a good topic, but in uh, geothermal wells, if you have a closed loop system where you basically, you see it at schools, elementary schools, they'll scrape the earth, they'll take it down five feet or whatever, and they'll lay out all these pipes and, you know, fill up a football field. And, uh, and then they'll bury it up, right? And it's got this grout around it, special stuff to keep it from you know, having issues. You can do vertical, you can do horizontal, but it's limited. It has a finite amount of space. Uh, that the water can, that the heat can reject uh, through the tubes into the ground. And these wells will saturate uh, heat. Um, or you will deplete them of, of heat um, in the winter. And that's usually at the end of a season, right? So the summertime you're dumping heat into that field and that temperature, that field starts to creep up. So around the soil, there's moisture. And that's where, you know, that's gaining the soil and the moisture is gaining that heat at the end of the summer. 
if your field is not big enough, your temperature will rise and now you will have issues meeting load because you can't dump all that heat out. It's already full. Uh, same in the winter, if you're pulling heat out. If you get to the end of the winter and your field was too small um, and the, uh, the field now is getting colder and colder, well, you're, and you're trying to pull heat out, now, you, now you're undersized, your field's undersized, and your equipment might be sized just right. But if it can't get enough heat to put into the space, then everyone's getting cold. That's what that big formula is up there that I drew. That's one, that's one of them. That's, that LC is the length that you need for the cooling. There's a one that says LH, and it's got a bunch of the same other variables and stuff in it. But it's just algebra, but it's a lot of algebra. Yeah. Okay, but, but what he's talking about is figuring out, making sure you got that LC or that LH right. And there's right. contractors and engineers that go through a lot of trouble to make sure that's right, because if they screw it up, they're living with it. And then Whatever. it's, <laughs> and it's, you know, it's, that means tearing stuff out, and that usually means lawsuits. And that, and that means going to your insurance and capping your insurance, and we're talking big deal, millions of dollars. So that's where it really pays to know what you're doing, and it's, for the, it's not for the faint of heart. You've got to know what you're doing. You get in this business. There are guys who specialize in the stuff. When they get good at it, then they can end up making a decent profit because they've been there, they've done it, but those first few jobs, they are burning a ton of time and effort trying to make sure they're doing it right. And they're doing everything you see in the textbooks, but there's all those things you have to learn in the field. So there's, I, I was telling Dave before the uh, class started that there are just a handful of guys that will do all that stuff. They're figuring out, they're experts at figuring out the soil and and the fields and knowing how to do this and matching it up to the heat pump. So in a geothermal system, you really have two parts of the job. You have the equipment in the building and you have the field and the pumps in between. So a lot of engineering goes, almost more goes into the field. And there's software that can help you generate these uh, values. But there are so many details that go into it. I don't do that work here. I, I've never um, done it either. Yeah. And yeah. geothermal uh, heat pumps are sold quite a bit right now and they're not going into these fields. They're going into uh, uh, server rooms or any kind of uh, you know, switch room that generates you know, a lot of heat, a lot of spot heat. And they're using dry coolers in Seattle um, because the code um, re 